Good morning, everybody. Good afternoon. Thank you for joining us for this webinar. The title of this webinar is Fact or Fiction on DTG Machines and Printing. We're thrilled that you tuned in, and we are also excited to have with us Terry Combs and Jeff Morgenthaler, two members of the DTG Dream Team from Equipment Zone. Uh, you know, before we started, Terry, we were talking briefly about the fact that DTG technology has been, what now, 15, 16? Maybe About 16 of, years, Jay. Yeah, it uh, start, started in 2004, and the first white ink was 2006. And uh, so it's, it's fairly new. Uh, you know, it's, uh, it's in its infancy still. But, yeah, uh, especially when you compare it to other decorating techniques, right? Correct, correct. And, and you were at the epicenter of DTG, the, the, the birth of that. Uh, Absolutely. And, I was and at so, US, US Screen, uh, the originator of the T-Jet, and, and I, I saw uh, the, the original T-Jet because it wasn't T-Jet 1 yet. It's just like World War I. It wasn't World War I until World War II. <laughs> oh, that's true. <laughs> so, I never thought of that. So, uh, so yeah, I saw, I saw the original T-Jet printing and said, uh, I remember Scott Fresner, who owned uh, US Screen, saying, I think the, the, the entire industry just changed. And I said, you know, I think so too. Now, he thought it would eliminate screen printing. But uh, from day one, I always said, you know, this is going to be just another part of how we decorate garments and how we decorate products. So um, I, I'm, Very good. I'm Very happy good. that Jeff, I was right and he was wrong. <laughs> ah, exactly. It's always nice. Uh, Jeff, you've been around the block. You were also in one of the early stages of DTG printing. So it's not like this is just a two or three year stint for you, correct? Right. In fact, we were right across the parking lot. Um, from where Terry was working and uh, we decided to stay out of the whiting business. We started selling direct to garment printers that were made in Italy from a company called MS one. And uh, man, I don't miss those days. Those were crazy. <laughs> um, big conveyor belts and the shirt would just pass all the way through the printer and you couldn't go back and reprint or the alignment would be off. But uh, you know, Terry, I was just thinking when you were talking about those T jets, we've had two, two people, get on our chat in the past week and ask about those and ask for support on them. So there are people still out there. Trying so to if they're cranking away all these years later. Yeah. Imagine that. Imagine that. Well, it's uh, let's transition now into some of the questions. Fact or fiction is the, uh, uh, the outline here. It's our, it's our, it's our goal to answer some questions and bring some clarity specific to DTG printers, the machines themselves and to the decorating process. So I'm thrilled that we have uh, 62 people live that are listening or watching. And uh, really you guys are the stars of the show. So I'm gonna start with the first question to you, Terry. And then Jeff, if you have any value to bring, please add that afterwards. And then we'll check in the chat uh, for those of you following along at home or wherever you are, we hope that you're safe. We hope that you are well. We hope that we get through this quickly. Uh, none of us has a crystal ball, but I, I expect that uh, inside of four or five weeks, we're going to start to see things trickling back to uh, some version of sanity. Hopefully it's sooner and hopefully everybody listening in and their families are well. So Terry, question number one, can you print 100% polyester with all DTG printers? That is a, a great question. And, and uh, here's what people hear out there. There are at least two companies that say, we are the only DTG printer that can print on polyester. Here, here's a little secret for all of you out there listening about DTG. What you can do on one printer, you can do on all printers. What you can't do on one, you can't do on any. So uh, all these printers use a water-based ink technology. And so uh, it, here's why you hear some people say, I can, other people say you can't, because it's a, it's a long process. You have to pre-treat, you have to dry it. You have to pre-treat a second time. You have to dry it. You're going to print it like a normal, if it's a, say it's a navy shirt, you're going to print it like a normal color shirt. You're going to print a white underbase. You're going to print color. But the curing is where we, we get tripped up. And anybody who's out there who's a screen printer or doing any type of decoration on polyester where heat is involved, you know that you're going to have dye migration. And for, for anybody who doesn't know, dye migration means that the dye on the polyester, because when you dye cotton, it absorbs into the cotton. When you dye polyester, it sits on top. And so under heat, that dye will release and float in your ink. So it's called dye migration. Let's say that's a red shirt, that, that white print becomes pink because of the dye, the red dye floating in your white ink. So what you have to do is limit your, your temperature. Now we're, we're normally curing at 340 degrees. You, you can't do that. That's going to cause huge dye migration. So what you do is you cure at 275 
for 45 seconds, not enough to cure the shirt. So you do it a second time, 275, 45 seconds, not enough. You do it a third time, 275 for 45 seconds, then you can get an acceptable, and by acceptable, I mean a saleable shirt, uh, but it's a long process. So some people say you can do it because yeah, you can. Other people say you can't do it because do you really want to? Are you gonna make any money doing it? So. So yes, you can print polyester on all, on 100% cotton, or I'm sorry, 100% polyester. Uh, you can print 100% polyester shirts on a DTG printer. <laughs> Spit it out, Terry. Spit it out. Man, that sorry. was a long way. That was a great answer, though. That was a long Spit sentence, it. wasn't it? <laughs> yeah. Jeff, you probably need to bring some clarity to this. Uh, you know, if you go onto our website and you go to the Epson uh, F2100 page and you scroll down. Jeff, what is our website, by the way? Oh, it's equipmentzone.com. Ah, uh, yes. Yes, indeed. Okay. Yeah, we have a lot of useful information on that page specifically for the F2100. We actually state on there that you can print on 100% polyester. Because like Terry said, you can do it. But when you talk to uh, either of us, uh, you know, whether you call us to ask us questions or it's at a trade show, we're probably going to steer you away from it because of what Terry just said. It's a lengthy process. Um, the prints look okay. You know, Epson um, at the end of 2017 or 2018, <laughs> getting my years mixed up, they made a, a they, they had a, a big buzz going because they were talking about the new um, pre-treatment specifically for 100% polyester coming out. Well, it came out and a lot of people started selling it before they even tested it. Remember that, Terry? That was just crazy. Well, absolutely. Yeah. Which so, brings me, that brings me to a question, Jeff. So is, is in order for this to work or either of you can answer this, is a different pre-treatment solution required? So let's say, let's say I was, I got to do it. I've got my number one customer says, you know, they've got Under Armour and they need 10 of them. I don't care if it takes you all day. I need these 10 printed. Am I going to have to use some special pre-treatment solution or would it be the same? Well, that, that's where I was kind of headed with this. And that okay. is that, um, the Epson pre-treat that is specifically for polyester doesn't look much different or any better than if you just use the regular uh, pre-treat for dark garments. Um, it's a thicker solution, so you need a, a pre-treater that can handle it, and not many can. You need a, an industrial pump in your pre-treater to be able to spray that. But we never sold it because we didn't like the results, and it's a lot of work, and most clients just aren't going to do it. You know, Jeff, also add to that with the Epsom polyester pretreat, you have to, uh, after you print and cure that shirt, you also have to rinse it in cold water to take the residue of that pretreat out. Whereas if you use just regular pretreat, you don't, you can skip that step. Wow. Nice. All right. So would we say that then it is a fact that you can print with an Epsom F2100 DTG printer on to polyester? It's a fact. We need it's to a stamp fact. across the screen. Boom, fact. we do. Fact. <laughs> okay, excellent. Okay, uh, question two, Jeff. It's, it's really a derivative of the first question, but because of the variety of substrates, uh, fact or fiction, can you only print on 100% cotton? That is not a fact. Okay, we, we, we did just explain that, that we can print on oh, that. You but want more, you want, you want some more. Yeah, so tell me, so tell me besides 100% cotton, what's my range? So um, again, you go to our website, it'll say you can print up to a 50-50. Now remember what Terry was saying about how this is a water-based ink, it's designed to bond with natural fibers. So the more unnatural fibers that you put in there, the more synthetic fibers that are in that shirt, the less that ink wants to bond with it. Uh, so will it print on a 50-50? Yes. The clients that I've talked to that have actually tried that get very frustrated. They don't like the results and they swear they'll never do 50-50s again. Um, but for 60-40s, uh, we've heard very good results, especially from the 60-40 shirts that you get from Cotton Heritage. Uh, we have tri-blends that we have tested that work fantastic. In fact, um, I have a tri-blend that I prefer wearing over 100% cotton. It just feels better. It breathes better. I like it. But not all tri-blends work equally. So it, a lot of that depends on how much of that shirt is natural and how much is synthetic. And so we have a list of shirts that, are, that we've tested and that we think work great. And we're happy to send that around. 
Perfect. That'd be a great follow-up. Uh, th those of you who are at asking questions, uh, you, you're welcome to do that. For right now, it's a little easier if you would use the chat dialog box. Um, I'm checking back and forth. By the way, this is Jay, the, uh, uh, the face. <laughs> you can't see me. I won't even go there. Um, so here is a question. People are, people are asking about pretreatment. So I want to I let those folks know that you've asked those questions. I've seen them. We are going to talk about pretreatment here in just a second. So, but we have a follow-up question first uh, regarding um, question number three, factor fiction. So Terry, all 100% cotton substrates print the same, right? Uh, they do not, Jay. And, and primarily what we're looking for is a ring spun cotton. And, and the reason for that is not because it's ring spun at all, but because a ring spun cotton is, is made with thinner threads than regular cotton. And that translates for us to being a tighter weave and a smoother surface. So the smooth, <clears throat> excuse me, the smoother the surface, the, the more crisp that image is going to be on there. So uh, you're going to need to do some testing. Just like Jeff said, we have shirts that we've tested and we recommend that, uh, that, that we really like to print on. And, uh, you know, you'll, you'll see at the trade shows just about every DTG manufacturer, every reseller are printing on the same shirts. And, and uh, primarily it's going to be Cotton Heritage, but, uh, but there are a few others that print just as well. And you'd certainly be welcome to reach out to us for that. And, and let, me, let me jump back to, your, to the question about the blends also, if that's okay. Yeah, um, one definitely. thing you can do is, if you're printing on a 50-50 and, and yeah, the print's going to look a little dull is you can pre-treat dry it, pre-treat it a second time, dry it. And, and that's going to give you a little bit better image on a 50-50. On a but Jeff is absolutely correct. The higher the cotton content, the better that print's going to look. Okay, excellent. Now we've had several people, as soon as you started talking about brands of shirts, you know what they're going to ask. So maybe you could give us just the top two, top three favorites that you know, Terry, or that you know, Jeff. And then as a follow-up, what I would encourage everyone to do is to reach out to Jeff and or reach out to uh, Terry and make sure that you can get that full list because there's too many for us to go through right now. We sure. want to get to some other questions. But Terry, what are some of the brands that you know that we've tested personally that we print on and why do we like them? Uh, Cotton Heritage 1082 is, is the one that we normally use at trade shows. Uh, Cotton Heritage has a location on each coast. Uh, you, you, don't, you don't buy that through a Sanmar or somebody like that. They do sell directly, but uh, that's the one you're going to see everybody using at trade shows. Uh, the next one that, that, that we really like a lot, and it's fairly new, is the Sanmar District DT-104. A um, couple more, American Apparel 2001, and then Next Level 3600. All those, we get really, really good prints. And we have, about, we have a list of about 10 that, that we recommend. Jeff, anything to add to that? Um, well, those are, those are the top ones. Okay. The the Bella Canvas 3001, the All Style, we have a Haynes and Anvil. So there's a lot. And I see that somebody asked a question about which ones do not. They want a list of which ones do not. Yeah, but I was going to say, can you give us one or two that you know, even though it's possible to print on, that you well, would recommend stay away from these? Yeah. So, you know, we, we get asked a lot about the... Um, Gildan Ultra Cotton. Gildan, thank you. My, my, <laughs> my Gildan, we're on the same page. My, my mind just went, but it comes up a lot. Now, I'll tell you, when, when I've tried them, it's tricky. Um, we have a client or a friend um, in Mississippi who uses that exclusively. That's all he uses, and he's very successful with it. So while we don't have great results with it, he does, but he does a double pre-treat on it. So... Um, you know, if it's, we have this list, we can email it around. If it's on the list, then you know it's going to print well. If it's not, then you're going to have to do your own testing and check it out. You know, the other thing about, uh, about using these shirts that we recommend also is, is you don't have to go in and tweak the, the uh, uh, print modes. You, you can just use standard print modes. Do you have to do anything to them and still get a really, really good print? And that's important. I, that that's really important. I'm glad that you brought that up, Terry. We're, we're always looking at this from the perspective of the efficiency of the printer and also to yield the highest 
best quality print. So can you print on another substrate? Yeah, of course you can. But by the time you finish tinkering and tweaking and adding this element and, and, and a little extra time over here and a double pre-treat and a double heat press and a park it, park that white, level six. Yeah, now, now you're at like 10 minutes per shirt. So yeah. uh, lots of interesting comments and questions. We're not going to be able to go into all of them, but somebody did bring up RTP, right? So that's something that we might want to throw that shirt into the mix. What, what does that, that mean? Was that RTP that, that brought that up? Uh, it was As far as I know, it was not, but good, <laughs> good question. Brian, thanks for tuning in. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> We're pretty familiar with those guys, there. right? And they print well? <laughs> yeah, we like those guys. And I'll tell you what, um, I'm impressed. They, as far as I know, they're the only shirts on the market that you can currently purchase that are already pre-treated. So it takes that pre-treating... Um, process out of your equation uh the shirts are a little bit more expensive but you know that's take that's satisfying all that work that you have to do so right. you don't have to do it and they print fantastic i'm, I'm impressed with it they look really good yeah absolutely. terry what's what's a potential downside not not that there's anything wrong with the rtp shirts themselves but wh where could there potentially be a gap well, if you decide that all I'm going to do is RTP apparel or, and, and there are other ones that are coming into the marketplace as well, probably, um, we're probably looking at, at, at fall or maybe the, the uh, Impressions Expo in Long Beach. But uh, um, the downside is, is a couple of things. One is inventory because those shirts are really, really popular. And, and I know those guys are working hard over there uh, at, at Image Armor. That's RTP. Uh, working hard to keep their inventory levels up, but it's but it's hard for them to do. And here's the other question that you run into: uh, if you say all I'm going to print are these 12 or 15 colors that that RTP offers, your very next customer is going to say, "Well, I need Tennessee orange." <laughs> well, guess what? RTP is never going to have Tennessee orange. And and if you show them an orange shirt, they're going to look at you like that's nah, not Tennessee orange. <laughs> so you're still going to have to pre-treat shirts unless you just have a website. These are the, the shirts that we offer and nothing else. You, you're going to have to have some method to pre-treat, even if you do RTP shirts. Perfect. Well said, which leads us to our next two questions. And we've had several people in the chat asking about pre-treatment, um, what works best. Um, you know, we, some people are talking about they, they've gotten a better output with uh, uh, let, let's see, they say, we've noticed that if we flash our white base coat with a heat gun, our print comes out brighter. So all of the things that you guys have noticed and that you've experimented with, we're not going to necessarily contradict them because if they're working for you, then they're working for you. But what we are trying to say is that to the degree that you can systematize this for maximum efficiency and maximum high quality output, that is our goal as a company at Equipment Zone and these two members of the DTG Dream Team, they're gonna tell you that, sure, you could print on the Gildan Ultra, but you're gonna have, by the time you're done, you, you will have spent more time monkeying around with a less expensive shirt than you would have had you started with a cotton heritage that was properly pre-treated and then printed on a standard setting on the Epson F2100, right? Am I right, guys? You're absolutely correct. All right, yep. so can I, can I throw you for a curve, for a curveball? are you ready? We're ready. Sure. Throw it. Okay. All right. Hey. <laughs> <laughs> was that shocking? Yeah. That was, that was a curveball. <laughs> what? Okay. So now you get to see the uh, the voice behind some of these questions. Um, I figured out what was wrong with my video and fixed it while we were. See, I was multitasking the whole time. Aren't you impressed? Yeah. And can, and can totally you see that amazing shirt behind me? Look at that, Terry. Are you impressed? I'm, Jeff, are I'm you impressed? incredibly impressed. I Let's did that just for one. you guys. I'm, I'm a little impressed, not a lot. All right. Well, maybe <laughs> Harry's impressed. That's what's most important. Okay, back to pre-treatment. Okay, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to start this off to you, Terry. Okay. Pre-treating with a power sprayer works just as well as an automatic pre-treater, right? Um, sometimes. It's neither true nor false because if you practice using a hand sprayer, uh, you can get a really good quality print. But the, the issue is consistency. An automatic pre-treat machine, every shirt is going to be pre-treated exactly the same. Uh, the other issue you have, there's a lot of waste in, pre in using a, a, a hand sprayer. Hey, if, if an automatic pre-treat machine isn't in your budget, that's, that's where you need to go with a, with a hand sprayer. But a lot of waste, a lot of overspray. 
people tend to use too much pre-treat when they hand spray. Uh, I've seen this demonstrated at, you know, we've had open houses before. Well, we'll demonstrate it. And every single time somebody who's there who hand sprays, they go, oh yeah, I use way too much. <laughs> and so, because if this much is good, this much more has to be better, right? It's not. Yeah. It's always better, right? <laughs> more okay, is always so better. <laughs> so it's not fact or fiction, but we would have a preference. And it's not just because we are the industry's leading automatic speed pre-treater, pre-treatment machine maker. Wow, that's a mouthful. Um, what, but to Jeff, maybe you could bring some more light onto this pre-treatment discussion because a lot of people have asked questions in the chat. And I know you get this question on a consistent basis. You know, what's the best method? Um, if, if I do use a power Wagner or Wagner power, I don't remember which way it is. If I do use that handheld device, then, then what, am I, what am I looking at? What's my, what are my future challenges? Well, you don't, you don't want to breathe that solution and what happens when you're when you're spraying it is it, it can mist out in the air so you're going to have to wear a mask okay mm. and those aren't available today so. <laughs> Good luck with that. right you make your own i suppose um you're going to want to build a cardboard booth so that that spray doesn't get out in, into other things you're not going to be able to do it in the same room as where your printer is you're probably right. going to do that in your garage or in the warehouse if you're working out of a shop and then you have um you know it's messy and it, and then you have waste because you, you can't start spraying on the shirt and then spray across it and stop and then come back down because now you're, you're going to end up with these heavy lines. So you got to start off of it and off of it, come back across off of it. So now you're spraying off the shirt and ultimately, um, like Terry said, you know, if this, if it's not in your budget to get a pre-treat machine, start out this way, get in the business and make that part of your, your uh, business plan to have one within a couple of months or three months down the road. You'll, it, it'll change the way you, you uh, produce. It'll make you more profitable to have and, and I would imagine, Terry, maybe you could speak to this, that if you're using that Wagner power sprayer, you, you could be putting on too much. Is that what your point was? And what, and what if there's too, if it's, is it too heavy? Has that become the, the situation? Right. Uh, you know, if it's way too much, the, the image could actually wash out because now you're printing on pre-treat rather than on the garment. But um, more to the point, some people say, you know, I don't like uh, DTG printed shirts because I don't like that box around it. And I'm not talking about the outline of the, uh, of the heat press. I'm talking about the, the shirt being stiff around the image area. If that shirt is stiff, you're using way too much pre-treat. You, you shouldn't feel the pre-treat on the shirt once that shirt's printed and dried, so or printed and cured. So uh, th that's the big thing is, is that stiff feel. Now, uh, pre-treat washes out with the first wash, but it doesn't make a great presentation to your customer okay. if, 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 that, if that stiff box is around the shirt. Gotcha. So, okay, so we would say that it is both fact and fiction, meaning there are some potential downsides, some serious downsides that you're going to have to factor if you are using a hand approach. Now, I, I, I'm still reading. I literally read this three or four days ago over the weekend. I, I can't keep track of time right now. It's too weird. Um, people are still paint brushing, not, not a roller, a paintbrush that they're trying to stroke in the same direction to help put down more. As you can see, I'm, I'm in my mind, I'm, 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 I'm stroking this t-shirt. What is that about? I, I can't get over that. What is that? That is, uh, that is old information. That is something that somebody recommended before pre-treat machines or before they were popular as a way to apply. And then um, they have this, that the fibers need to lay down. Yeah, that, that was the point they were making. They're trying to get the they fibers to all go in the same direction. The same direction, get all those fibers laying down. When we pre-treat t-shirts, that, that spray just goes down right on top of it, and then we heat press it, and it flattens the fibers. Okay. We, so, do, not, we do not worry about getting those fibers all the same direction. Uh, and if anybody wants to see the results, we're happy to send you a sample t-shirt. So, you know, there's so many, uh, there's so many, we're getting, we're getting blitzed with about a thousand pre-treatment questions. Sounds like we need to do a dedicated webinar for just pre-treatment. So let's, let's all take a note of that. But I also know, Terry, that you, you've got a great answer to 
a lot of the people that are, are saying, well, I do this, or I've done this and it works well, or I've had to do this. What's your standard reply to that? What you have a great way of phrasing that. Well, most advice that you find on the, on the internet about any type of decoration is a band aid. There's something that's gone wrong in your process. So you put a band aid on it rather than figure out where you went wrong to start with. And, and that's true of, again, all decoration methods. So, so when people say use a paint roller after you spray it, use a, use a paintbrush. I've heard people say use a squeegee. Um, that's a band aid because they've done something incorrect and probably laid down too much pre-treat or used a spray, uh, a hand sprayer and didn't get an even lay down. So by using that brush, you're trying to even out that, that, uh, that, amount of pre-treat on that shirt. If you pre-treat it correctly to start with, you don't need any band-aids. And, and okay. unfortunately, the internet is full of band-aids. And, and, you know, take a step back. If you are pre-treating your shirts, uh, heat pressing them and not getting a good print, you did something wrong there. And, and, you know, all these questions, Jay, is because pre-treating is critical to getting a good quality print. It's yeah. uh, the, the shirt, the pre-treat, and the art. That's, those are the critical parts of, of creating a really great printed DTG garment. Very well said. I think we should end right there. Oh, we can't do that. We've got way more to go. Uh, Jeff was getting up. He was Jeff was, he Jeff was, was out. taking his shirt off and he was going out to finish yeah. his work day by he the pool. Hit the pool. Uh, it's only going to be 84 in Phoenix today. I know you guys are interested in that weather announcement. And for those of you tuning in from the Northeast. Um, Nine inches okay. of sun coming down and no wind in sight. Whew, I didn't have to scrape any of that sunshine off my windshield <laughs> this morning. How about you guys? Um, okay, so lots of questions there. I think, would it be wise for us to, to schedule a pre-treatment? I, I think so, some of that? because okay. that's where most of the misinformation is, and that's where most people... Uh, that's where most people uh, have their issues is in the pre-treating process. Okay. So I would just like to add one more thing to this real quick. Yes, Make please quick. do. Because somebody asked um, about um, what is a good pre-treat machine. Yes. They well, did. we happen to make a great <laughs> pre-treat machine at Equipment Zone. Uh, it's, it's designed and manufactured by Equipment Zone in New Jersey. Yeah, don't hold that against us, but. Uh, <laughs> no way. Never. <laughs> Just kidding, Amy. I know Amy's watching. They're from New Jersey. It's New Jersey, not Jersey. We've been oh, we've been corrected Jersey. on that many times. That's right. <laughs> but the uh, but the the pre-treater is designed specifically with you in mind to be easy to operate, simple to maintain, uses an industrial pump, puts down the perfect amount of pre-treat every time with minimal amount of waste. It's consistent, it's efficient, and it comes at a great price. And you can go on our website, equipmentzone.com after this and check it out. And we can be in contact with you and talk more about it. Hey, let me, let me add to that, Jeff. Also, when you talk about uh, little waste uh, on the speed treater, and we have, uh, we have customers who, who use as, as many as eight printers with one pre-treat machine. But uh, at the end of the day, you, you can take a paper towel and wipe out any any excess, any overspray. Whereas other pre-treat machines on the market, if there's a gallon bucket or two gallon buckets on the back of that machine to catch overspray, that is all going down the drain. You can't reuse that. I don't know about your shop, but my shop has has dust and lint in the air. One one piece of lint in that pre-treat is going to clog the nozzles. So. Um, if, if there's a bucket on the back of the machine, that is just wasted pre-treat that you're pouring down the drain. So and lots to, by the way, don't pour it down the drain. <laughs> <laughs> it's not harmful though, but you should. No, know. it's, it, you know, here, here's a little secret on pre-treat that, that most people don't tell you. And I don't know why. Uh, yes, there are binders in, the, in that to, to help uh, hold the ink onto the shirt and help, help hold that white ink up on top of the shirt. But, but it's primarily, uh, it's the, the secret ingredient is salt water. So the secret ingredient in pretreatment covers three fifths of the world. So, <laughs> and and, and, and think, let's think about this. Why? If, if you have a layer of, of dried salt on, on a, the surface of a shirt and you put water-based ink on top of it, what's that salt going to do? It's going to pull the water out of that ink, right? It's exactly. screen printers. Yeah, screen printers are going to print a white underbase and flash it from the top, 
pre-treat basically flashes the white water-based ink from the bottom up. It's pulling, it's pulling the water out of that ink so that it dries on top of the shirt. And that's, that's the secret. That's the secret ingredient. It's, it's uh, salt water. Look at you, Mr. Chemistry. Wow. <laughs> that's right. I was paying attention in chemistry class. I'm impressed. In the okay. 70s. We'll dive deep on pretreatment. And I think, Jeff, um, if you put it on your calendar, because we should do that live so that people can, um, you know, Good see thing. it. I'm not telling you what to do, just a suggestion. Um, okay. We're going to transition away from pretreatment and go back to factor fiction. Um, and this one starts with, um, uh, to you, Terry, because it's an odd question. By odd, I mean the number odd. Seven. <laughs> Uh, can I turn my machine off? Fact or fiction? Um, it is a fact if you own an Epson F2000, F2100. It is fiction with basically any other machine. Most machines have to run 24 hours a day. Uh, and the reason for that is most machines on the market, uh, the, the print head did not start life as a direct-to-garment print head. It started life as a desktop, usually Epson printer. So when someone says, hey, it's got an Epson print head, just like the F2100, it's not just like the F2100. That print head uh, came out of a, a tabletop printer. And Epson, by the way, does not sell print heads to any of these companies. They buy these printers on the open market they take them apart, take out the print head and start pumping a different ink system through it. And here's the rub. Uh, Epson, by the way, is the largest manufacturer in the world of print heads. So they know a little bit about print heads. So what happens is this, there are adhesives inside of a print head and those adhesives are resistant to the ink system that goes through it. Well, if you change the ink system, then all of a sudden that print head is no longer resistant to that ink, which means you do things like have a wet capping station. Wet capping station, all that's doing is keeping that print head from clogging. Or you have people who say, you have to run it 24 hours a day. You have to print a shirt every day. If you leave it for more than three days, you have to take out all the ink and flush the lines. That is a sure sign that that print head was not made to, to use DTG inks. Now, in our situation, you know, we're, we're all here in Phoenix. We have five people that work out of our Tempe, Arizona office, but we all have home offices too. That's where we all are. Well, we are, you're in the office, Jay. But, but uh, over Christmas last year, nobody, everybody worked in their home offices. Nobody went in the office for three weeks over Christmas. That printer, that, that, that printer was sitting there, turned off. We came in and, and um, Wade and I had a demo to do. And we got there about 30 minutes before the demo. Wade turned the printer on, did a head cleaning. We started printing shirts again. There's not a printer on the market that you can do that with other than the Epson. So, the why, way, so I, Jeff, Terry, why do, oh, go ahead, go ahead. I was gonna say that that printer that you're talking about, Terry, is one of the first F2100s made. Right. Oh, ours, the, the one we have in the office? Correct. Yeah, the one that's, that's right, right outside your office. It's yep. over three years old and we've never replaced the print head on it. Okay, right. so I have two follow-up questions to that. One we anticipated, and one was also from several other people that have been asking this question. So um, why are we getting asked this question? Besides, besides from Terry's answer, which was beautiful, I'd like to just be a little more, I don't want to say controversial, but more specific. I don't, I don't bring this up to like create drama or friction where there shouldn't be any, but I consistently, even me, I, you know, and I'm not in sales. I consistently hear something about brothers printers. They're, they're, they're telling their people not to turn off their printer. Now, is there an upside to that? Does that mean they use less ink? Okay. I, I need to clarify something about that, Jay, because that's been the case for a long time. Recently at a trade show, I've heard that they have changed that tune and that they are telling people you can turn it off. Okay. During the sales process, I have a feeling that after you purchase it, they're recommending that you don't. Oh, okay. And that you also need to have a humidifier into it. Now, you'll have to check with them. That's their printer. You'll have to get the facts. Yeah, from yeah, right. I'm not. I'm not trying. I didn't bring it up to try to bash on brother. I'm just saying that seems to be the feedback we hear or the pushback that we get, either or. Now well, we do. We do have a, a friend who who runs both printers, and runs them side by side, and is constantly frustrated by the fact that he does not, he cannot turn that printer off. It's on all the time, constantly running cleaning solution through it and ink. And it's very expensive uh, to do that over the course of a month. 
Okay. Well, and, which and, and speaking of cleaning question. solution, let, let me Go jump ahead. in there. Uh, the, the Brother printer on average, is, average uses about $100 in cleaning solution every month. The Epson uses $8 in cleaning solution every month. So that, that, that tells you why that printer is running 24 hours a day. They've got to pump a lot of cleaning solution. And here's why, uh, in my opinion. Um, they, they run in their white uh, ink cart, or I'm sorry, their, their white print head and right behind it, the color print head. Well, that white has to dry so quickly before that color ink gets on top of it that uh, they, they have issues with that white ink wanting to, to dry in the print head. So that's why at trade shows, you'll see they'll have a, um, a, a, a humidifier under the printer at a trade show. Uh, you won't see that uh, in, in our booth and certainly uh, trade show arenas and, and convention centers are not climate controlled by any stretch of the imagination. We take our printers, you know, we, we, we have, have a crate where we wheel it out, we plug it in, we print a shirt. At, when we're done at the show, we turn it off, we don't take the ink out, wheel it back into the crate and ship it a week or more back to equipment zone. They take it right. out of the crate, turn it on, do a head cleaning, wham, bam, you're done. So uh, you can take the Epson printer out of its environmental element and, uh, and, and still have really great success. Well, it leads me to three other questions, but I have, to, I have to bring up the flip side of this coin, which I've heard a lot, and I need you guys to give it the straight story, not the sales spin. And I know that you guys are not, neither of you being members of the DTG Dream Team, you are not predatory salesmen. Um, why do I hear that people who have the F2100 and every time they turn it on or off, it's running through a lot of ink and they're complaining that it's wasting ink. Is that a fact or a fiction? Is it both? What's the story there? Is that for Jeff? Neither. Um, yeah. So when you, when you turn off your printer, it's not, it's not um, flushing ink through your print head. It's putting, cleaning solution down through the, the, the tubes. It's doing its tube wash. That replaces what you used to do manually with the F2000. Okay. So no, that's, uh, that's fiction. So it's not wasting ink every time it's turned on? No. There, there is a, the ink. You, you can turn that feature off where it goes through a, a, a head clean when you turn the printer on. Uh, what our techs recommend is, listen, if you only run that printer once a week, leave that feature on so it does a head cleaning. But if you're using that printer most every day, uh, all you need to do when you turn it on is do a nozzle check. And, and then if, if in the nozzle check, and that's basically checking all the nozzles on the print head. And if you see breaks in, say, the yellow, then you just clean the yellow. And, and so then you're talking pennies to clean that ink. But uh, yeah, so... Yeah, if, okay. if somebody's going through that, that's a feature that their technician, wherever they bought it from, they, um, they failed to have them turn that off during the setup and training phase. And, and Jake, can I add one more thing about why uh, Epson puts cleaning solution through the print head and down into the capping station is a lot of people don't realize that they think that their print head clogged because the white ink is sitting in the print head. What really happens is if that capping station, capping station is where the print head parks itself after it prints. What happens is that capping station gets clogged, then it can't pull ink through, that's when you have a clogging issue. So if you keep the capping station open, then it almost eliminates any, any clogging issue. So what we're doing is we're putting cleaning solution into that capping station, flushing it out all the way down to the waste tank so that that's a, a free flow and so it can pull ink through and, and it, it virtually eliminates clogging. But a lot of people don't realize that's where the clog starts in the capping station, not in the print head. Gotcha. Thank you for that clarifying point, Mr. Combs. Uh, two, two stars for Terry. You, you, uh, I feel like you're with the White House Press Corps. I, I have three follow-up questions. <laughs> If you can see the chat going off and all of the questions, you'd, you'd understand why. So, so I, I can tell you right now at, at 1040, we are not going to make it through our entire list. So I am officially announcing that we will have a fact or fiction episode two to schedule in the very near future. I know, Jeff, I know you're excited. I'm excited. So, so we have so much more to cover, but two things came up. 
under the last series of questions that were specific to humidity. So I'm gonna send this back to you, Jeff. Jeff, could you give us a little bit more insight, understanding about the environment, the proper environment? We're talking temperature, we're talking humidity, we're talking lint and dust. What's the story, fact or fiction? How do we get that set up? What are the facts? Well, um, you know, we've talked about our shop there in, uh, in Tempe and uh, we're in a very hot, dry area here in Arizona. And um, so we run a humidifier in, in our shop. In, in the room. Around yep. 40, 45% humidity. That's where you wanna be. Um, try to keep it between 40 and, and 60%. Um, if you're a little bit over that because you're in Atlanta or you're in some very humid place, that's fine. Um, and then your, your normal working environment, you wanna avoid the extreme hots and the extreme colds, but um, working in your shop, uh, what's comfortable for you is gonna work for that printer. Are dust and lint an issue, Terry? Uh, yeah, they certainly can be because it's a, it's a, a machine that um, uh, prints through very, very tiny uh, nozzles. So dust and lint can certainly be an issue for you. And, and, and let me add something about humidity. This is true of all direct to garment printers. Every one of them needs at least 40% humidity in the room. So when you go online and you see somebody complaining about whatever printer and say, well, I love this printer, but it goes through an automatic head cleaning like every 45 minutes or an hour. That has nothing to do with the machine. That has everything to do with humidity because here's what people don't realize. They'll say, well, my humidity is at 25%, but I don't have any clogging issue. It's not just clogging because here's what happens. If you're below 40% humidity in that room, the print head will start to overheat. And how does the print head cool itself? It forces water through it. Where's the water come from? Your water base ink. So that printer is working really, really hard while um, you're at a low humidity level. If, you are, if your humidity is 40% to 45% or up, then that, at least with an Epson, it's gonna go through that automatic cleaning every six hours. So if it's doing it more, more often than that, it's, it's almost always your humidity. So when you see online the person complaining about that, 99% of the time, they don't have the right environment for the printer. Well said, gentlemen, thank you. Um, somebody asked about the high humidity. So um, the specifications from Epson are to keep it under 80. Okay. So 20 to 80 is what they say, but uh, we recommend that you're around 40, 40 to 60. You, you know, and, and, and guys, it's just like in any other type of decoration. If, if you have high humidity, you know, our, our friend Dane down in New Orleans, it, it's, a, it's a pinch humid there, just a pinch. <laughs> and, and, and here's what's going to happen, though. What happens is you can't get a good cure because that garment will absorb that moisture. That's right. And when you go to cure it, that garment is never going to get above 212 degrees until all that moisture is driven off. So the solution, if you're in a high humidity area, is, is hit that garment with the heat press before you print it to drive that moisture off or run it down your dryer belt to drive that moisture off. Then you're not going to have any problems. But the, the issue when it's really high is is you think you've got a good cure, but you have washout issues because that garment, the moisture in the garment kept that ink from curing completely. And lest anyone think that we're just kind of spouting off here, we did get some feedback that several, several have, have commented that they were told to not turn off their 2100 or then turn off their 2100s. And then some said, well, my original 2000, I was told not to turn it off. And then, so I, it sounds like there's just a giant, conflict of info out there like not, like and this has been the struggle i think with equipment zone is we're we're not telling you just necessarily because that's what we were told we're giving you this information from first hand use we are constantly printing we have technicians and printers in new jersey here in arizona um i'm probably the least prepared to go print well maybe terry um <laughs> but, <laughs> I know how. I just choose not to. <laughs> oh, well done. But Jeff is constantly printing. If you see us at a trade show, we're constantly printing. And the reason that we're printing is because we know that we have, we have to show you and earn your trust that what we're saying comes from practical application and actually printing, not just because that's what we heard on the internet or that's what we saw someone else say or that's what those guys told us to say. 
because we've had to contradict Epson a time or two based on personal experience and just say, well, that's not what we found. That's not what we're doing. Right. We, have, so, uh, we have multiple printers in New Jersey. We have a 2100 at, in our shop in, uh, in Tempe, our showroom in Tempe. Uh, we have 2100s that we take to trade shows. And at the end of every day, we turn the printer off. And it goes through that, that five minute cycle where it's, it doesn't turn itself off until it takes that cleaning solution, pumps it through the, the print head into the capping station out to the waste tank. And uh, now if you leave your printer on, it will do that process every 20 hours anyway. But, uh, but we always turn our printers off. And we, as, as Jeff mentioned, that uh, printer we have in Tempe, that was a prototype machine. Epson brought in six machines and gave one of them to us to test. And it, we've been running it, I, I'm going to say it's more than three years and never a print head replacement, never, uh, I don't think we've even had it serviced. So. Well, we've had two technicians that are constantly doing the right thing to maintain Correct. it. It's also in a proper uh, uh, it's in a proper environment. We also have a humidifier in the room, not underneath it. We also, um, you know, we're, we're careful. We're not, we're not perfect. Like you and said, that 45% is nice for my skin. So. <laughs> yes, it is in Arizona. We need all the humidity we can get. By the way, in the summertime, it's, it's somewhere, somewhere hovering between seven and 8% humidity. So that right. gives you an idea of why we need this to be, um, uh, the environment needs is play such an important role. And, and, but we have a very large room. And with, uh, with three offices attached and uh, we have one humidifier running and it keeps, keeps that room at 45%. Yeah. And, and, and Harry has reminded me that we're constantly shipping those printers to trade shows and back with ink in it. So it's not like, you know, it's, it's a, it's a sturdy printer that was just built to, to last if you maintain it properly. Um, okay. So let's, let's turn to another question. Um, which is relative to where we started a while ago with Jeff, and so I'm going to flip this one back to, uh, to you. Um, we talked about turning our machine off, not turning our machine off. And, and, and so let, that transitions us into, I, will I void my warranty if I turn my printer on its side or if I move it? Now, I know why we're getting asked that question, but maybe you could set the record straight. And then, Terry, you could tell us why we get asked that question a lot. Um, you can actually turn it on its side to go through a door. Um, you're going, you're going to have to secure the print head and do a little bit of preparation, undo the tubes in the back and, and put the stoppers in them. So ink doesn't come out, but then you're going to, you can turn it on its side and go through a door. I'm not aware of any other printer that can do that. And that's really been a big deal for us as we go to trade shows and we'll do classes. We show up to the, the conference room and it's a single door. And our printer is just a little bit wider than that door. So we prep it, we turn it on its side, go through the door and put it back down. Not a problem. We have a lot of clients that work out of their homes and that would be the only way to get it into their home, into their basement, upstairs. So I think that's a great feature that, um, that Epson has built into this printer. It was literally designed and made to be moved on its side, correct? Exactly right. Absolutely. And we have pictures of that, that, uh, you know, of us doing that at a show. That you can send around. Hey, I've even helped. So I know it's possible. Terry, why do we get asked that question so often? Well, interestingly enough, and, and, you know, at Equipment Zone, we're, we like, we like to give everybody all the facts and, and not everybody out there selling these machines, you know, they, they also sell screen printing equipment, embroidery equipment. So they, they don't necessarily know these inside and out, but, but uh, we were doing a presentation a couple of years ago out in California and I was just mentioning you could take it through a doorway on its side and somebody over on the right hand side goes, are you kidding me? <laughs> and, uh, and I said, were you not aware of that? And, and he said, no, I cut out a, a, the edge of my door to fit it through and everybody felt really bad for him. Then he said he cut both sides and then everybody didn't feel as bad. <laughs> but, uh, but how many people since then oh, have yeah. said to us, I set my machine up in my garage because uh, the person I bought it from said, no, you can't put it on the side. So, and so they couldn't get it in their house. Multiple people have told us that, but, but we've done it dozens of times and it, and it, it is built with ink in it to go on its side. And if anybody needs to move one, Hey, if you want to go and do events, you can take this machine and do events. It doesn't, does not impact your warranty at all. 
Um, but you, a lot of times you need to get it through a doorway and, and we can tell you exactly the like three or four steps you need to do to, to make that happen. Awesome. By the way, smart marketing bullet point number 27A, printing on site on demand with this printer is like rock star status. If you're not doing that and you would like to sell more shirts, do it because you're naturally marketing your business and you're also naturally driving people. People are pulled to it. They've never seen the process before. It, it, it's, it's always surprising to me when you get it out into the public, you get it out into the wild and you start printing, people are just magic. They're just, it's, it is, it's like a magic machine when you, right. when you haven't seen it before. And, and you're going to be charging 30 to $40 for those shirts on site. For yeah, sure. People will be amazed. Last year, Jay, you and I, Jeff couldn't go. So I got to go with you to South by Southwest and uh, we were in the next level booth and, uh, and uh, the crowd around watching those prints, people were just amazed at the technology. So it was huge. Shout out to next level. Sorry, we couldn't go back, but they canceled the event this year. Mm. Um, and by the way, they, we printed, I don't know, 50 shirts a day pr on, on those next level shirts and they came out great. So and thanks um, to the folks that printed threads in uh, Fort Worth for oh, that's right. loaning that's right. us their machine to and 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 printing their staff. and their staff. Yeah, <laughs> we mostly just stood there and talked about it. Let's just be well, honest. <laughs> you're the eye candy. Let's be honest. Okay, <laughs> back to seriousness. Uh, fact or fiction? So I, I, I'm going to push you guys again because you didn't give me the answer I was looking for. <laughs> why? Why are people continually asking us if this will void my warranty if I move it? I know the answer. Uh, Terry, I call on you. <laughs> uh, the, the brother machine, uh, you didn't hit the buzzer fast enough. The brother machine has to be moved by a technician, which means that uh, you would have to pay a technician to come and move that machine. And, and no, you, once it's in place in your shop, uh, that's, where, that's where it's supposed to remain. So that machine is not made to be taken to, to car shows and art fairs and all those places where, where we can sell over a weekend and, and, and make some really good money. Was that, okay. the, was that the answer you were searching for? Ding, 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 ding. <laughs> Terry, three stars. Jeff, oh, one. He's racking them up. I know. I, I well, know. let's see if you can redeem yourself with this next question. I doubt it. For $1,000. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> so we're going to transition into just a little bit of this. And as I said, I want to make a quick announcement that we are definitely now planning a episode two fact or fiction because we have about... 10 more questions to get through. And we've had so many of you uh, offer up your questions in the Q&A, as well as in the chat dialogue. So thank you for your participation. Uh, we're thrilled to be doing this. We're grateful that you're tuned in. A lot of you are not our customers. That's okay. We'd love to earn your business. A lot of you are our customers and you're coming back for more clarity, more information. Maybe you have new staff and you need to get retrained. This is a great time to figure out new decorating techniques. This is a great time to figure out how to be better at marketing. And obviously we've got uh, more webinars coming. Uh, we wanna be a resource for you during these uncertain times. We, we again, we hope you, your family, your staff are, are doing well and safe. And we know it's a struggle for some of you. So we thought this is what we can do. We could try to give some clarity, give some factual answers from firsthand knowledge, not band-aids from the internet, and try to help you build your business. That's really our point, that's our purpose. Um, that's what gets us exciting. So if you've ever talked to Terry and you're thinking, that is quite possibly the nicest salesman in the world. That's why, because he's not a salesman first. He does a great job at sales, don't get me wrong. He's trying to help you grow your, your business. He's your, your highest unpaid consultant. And Jeff is also, a, he's slightly more pushy, I will say that. Really? Hey, I only push because some people need it. That's right. That's what I was just going to say. He's like a great coach who's going to push you a little bit appropriately. You overcome that, that, that fear and, and, and you thank me for it afterwards. Well, listen, um, it's no surprise to me. I've known you both for more than really for about 20 years. Jeff, I've known you for longer, but I've also worked with you at, at several different events, several different companies, and I've seen you guys flourish and I want to brag on you for just a minute. You two, you two, the two of the people that there are still 65 of you tuned in today. These two gentlemen that you see right here are, are clearly responsible for somewhere between 45 and 50% of all sales in the United States for the F2000 and now the F2100 printer. So I compliment you, but I also want people to understand that why am I bragging on you? Because that would never have happened if you were full of BS, 
if you were given half-ass answers, sorry, if you, I'm just keeping it real, you know, so that's how I roll. If, if you guys were not the way you are, building relationships, caring for people first and trying to help them grow their business, that would never have happened, never. So it's a compliment to you, it's a compliment to Harry, it's a compliment to Equipment Zone for having hired you. And I think it's just awesome that we're able to do this. And so for all of you who are listening, I wanted to give that little shout out now, surprise, so I get a star. And to let you know that yes, we are recording this, so you'll be able to watch this again and, and hear, hear me brag on you guys. Thank, thank so. you, Jay. But I think you need to read Cindy's uh, quote right there real quick. Cindy, I bought several things from Jeff. And I wouldn't say he's pushy at all. Oh. <laughs> thank you. So what did your wife oh, buy from you? you? What was thank that? You. <laughs> uh, sorry, UPS just said hi. Okay. <laughs> Combs, C-O-M-B-S. Oh, it's Combs, not Coombs. Nice. <laughs> he did it again. Okay, back to our regularly scheduled session. We have about three minutes. We're going to take one more question, and then what we'll do is we'll wrap up, okay? So, so look forward to two things, the recorded session of this event, as well as episode two, Fact or Fiction, coming to a theater near you soon, like as in real soon. So, uh, Terry, to you, um, let's, let's transition a little bit into the operating costs of the printer. We hear a lot of people comparing us to other folks. I, I can't speak to the other printers as well as you can, but in terms of operating costs, in terms of expense, in terms of maintenance, fact or fiction, is the F2100 an expensive printer to, to use and maintain? It is fiction. Now there's a ton of misinformation out there. Uh, your print costs, and, and we base print costs on an average of a 10 by 12 image, even though the printer can print 16 by 20, uh, because most people print within 10 by 12. Go measure all your shirts in your t-shirt drawer, and, and you'll agree with me. So uh, a, a white shirt is going to be less than 50 cents. A color shirt is going to be about $2 in ink cost. Now, you know, you can use the highest uh, print mode and, and lay down twice as much white ink, but you don't need to do that. Uh, so you're, you're in that range. The cost of pre-treat is about 25 cents to maintenance on the machine. Your, your cleaning solution, uh, cleaning cartridge is $18.95 for a cartridge that lasts two and a half months. So it's about $8 a month. And then um, the only other expense is there's a, a print head cleaning kit because a lot of printers, especially the, the Frankenstein machines that have been, they've taken an, an Epson printer and created a new printer out of it they'll have a wiper blade in there and you, it's like a little windshield wiper and you have to clean that periodically through the day. With the Epson, there's a cloth roller that wipes the print head to clean it. You have to replace that after 1500 prints and 1500 prints means um, if it's a white underbase and a color on top, that's two prints. So if you're only doing color shirts with a white underbase, after 750 prints, you're going to replace that. It keeps the print head completely clean all the time. It's $108.95 for that replacement. So if you divide it out among the number of shirts, it's, it's very inexpensive, but it, it's really a brilliant way to keep that printer clean. And it cuts back on you doing any physical maintenance on the machine. Excellent answer, sorry. I was, I was trying not to be distracted by my phone. Um, <laughs> And I failed, so forgive me. I've, so been, I've I, been making a point of not looking at my phone since you called me up I, last, I, last show <laughs> for so laughing when I looked at my phone. <laughs> and I, I just did it. Add on to what, what Terry said real quick. So you brought up about $2 on a dark garment. When I did, um, we did a live demo webinar on Monday where unscripted, we yeah. picked the file and we printed it in front of everyone. And we didn't check that price ahead of time. I didn't even ask Roy um, what setting to print it on. And he just printed it at level three, which is the middle. There are six print quality levels that you can choose from. The default is three. And it came out looking fantastic. It looked perfect. It was about eight inches high and about 12 inches wide, I think. Mm -hmm. 11 inches wide. And it, was the, it was the Spartans graphic from one of Great Dane graphics that you yes. like. Yeah. Shout out to I saw Dane. I was there. Uh, and the cost on that was 89 cents. Wow. So I think when people get um, really expensive prints and they complain, well, wow, this costs a lot of money that I'm using a lot of white ink. Terry touched on this. I just wanted to emphasize it a little bit. You may be printing at um, print levels that are just too high. And sometimes you print at those 
print level is really high because you didn't pre-treat properly or you're using the wrong shirt. And this goes all the way back to yeah. the beginning of our discussion, how every step of the process is important. Listen, I, I can't emphasize that. I'm, a, I'm so glad that you, you pretty much ended on that because I was going to uh, add a story and I want to give it back to you guys when I'm done. So if you have anything to add to this, I, I've literally sat and watched two of our technicians, two, I, I'll just say argue because there's no other way. I, it started out as a discussion. It turned into an argument at a trade show where there was a, a, a it was not a client of ours, but he, they owned an F2100 and they were complaining how terrible that garment creator was and just going off on it. I mean, like, like this was the biggest pile of, you know, what that they like, how could Epson do this to me? Like they, like they have this amazing machine and then they didn't even put wheels on it. Right. Or something, you know, like, it's just, you know, I, and I was like, it, 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 so after 30 minutes of this, they came back to me and they said, pre-treatment and t-shirt. One safe guy finally admitted that he was using a power Wagner sprayer that was inconsistent and trying to roll it and was doing it on a Gildan shirt. They finally said, we're not prepared to have any discussion about garment creator with you because you're not, you're not using the system optimized for the best output. You've got a bandaid over here and a bandaid over here and you're choosing right. a poor quality shirt and then you want to blame the garment creator. So we've had several people ask in this chat about the appropriate settings, what settings, what are the difference in settings? How do I know which setting to choose? Sounds like maybe we could spend some time on that on another webinar, but Terry, could you wrap it up for us and back to Jeff to, to end us? You know, we, we're, we're a little bit over the hour mark. Is there sure. anything you'd like to say to that concept of have the right tools? Uh, absolutely. And, and uh, as I mentioned before, it, it's the shirt, it's the pre-treat, it's the quality of your artwork. If, if those three factors are going to make and break uh, this process. Hey, I do want to add one real quick thing. I, I know a lot of folks who are listening, their suppliers are may, maybe not open right now because of uh, where, where they're located. Equipment Zone does have stock on inks and supplies and Equipment Zone is open for business in, in New Jersey to ship, to ship those. So I'll, I'll Yield yeah, to excellent. Jeff. Yield, yield to Jeff. Jeff, you have the floor. Um, I, I noticed a couple of people asking for um, a webinar on Garment Creator. Uh, that's a great suggestion. Uh, we're talking about doing another fact or fiction, but we could do a, uh, a do one of these with a webinar using um, one of our technicians, maybe Roy. Roy would be awesome at that. Details. That would be, and you know what we should do is make sure that we're printing live too, so that people can right. see the difference of a, of a session that's got this shirt at this artwork, this pre-treatment, you know, walk it through and then do a comparison so they can see the difference between level three and level five and level six, et cetera. It's a good idea. That's a great idea. Okay. Gentlemen, you have been wonderful in every way. Um, appreciate your time. Uh, and especially right now, I mean, uh, we're not here to entertain you, <laughs> although the three of us have been known to get silly really fast. So um, I just, I do appreciate you both taking your time away from your families, your sales, and, and hopefully we've provided a stress-free uh, environment to enjoy and learn and listen. And so I'm going to press the stop record button. Is there anything to say before I do that? Hey, have fun out there. Stay safe and uh, stay healthy. Thanks, everybody. All right. Goodbye. Oh, I have one more thing. Oh, yeah. V visit our website because we've created a new webinar page. So we have previously recorded webinars that are there. And we're going to have another webinar next Thursday that we will be announcing soon. So pay attention to our website. Visit that webinar page often, both for upcoming webinars and previously recorded webinars. So visit equipmentzone.com. Right on. Goodbye, everybody.